Well, good evening to everybody from Istanbul and greetings from very hot London. And thanks to global warming, we sometimes have a good weather too. In California, they have weather all the time. So the first uh, speaker of the last session today is uh, Nikki Sivastava, and this will be for a change a quantitative talk after all these beautiful abstract things. We will have something maybe more real. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me. Uh, so indeed, this is a very concrete uh, talk. Uh, I, I think that the proof that I'm going to present is maybe the shortest proof I've ever talked about. I hope maybe we, you know everybody can understand the details. And please stop me if you have questions. So this is joint work with uh, uh, Jess Banks, Jorge Garza Vargas, um, uh, Archit Kulkarni, and Chotpagi Mukherjee, who are or were students at UC Berkeley. So the talk is about uh, diagonalization. Okay, so matrix is diagonalizable if it's similar to a diagonal matrix. Uh, and uh, okay, the, the similarity contains the right eigenvectors if it's written this way and the diagonal matrix contains the eigenvalues. Uh, so so here's, a, here's a matrix, it's a Hermitian matrix. It's a tri-diagonal Hermitian matrix. Um, and okay, it's obviously diagonalizable, it's Hermitian, and there's a picture of its eigenvectors there, which are orth orthonormal. Um, here's another uh, matrix, um, P, which is similar to the first matrix S uh, by a diagonal similarity. Uh, and this P is a Toeplitz matrix. Um, it is also diagonalizable, obviously, but uh, because of this uh, similarity C, the eigenvectors are. Are no longer orthogonal. In fact, they're highly non-orthogonal. So I plotted them in this picture here. And okay, this matrix is certainly not Hermitian. And then if you kind of uh, you know take the limit of this process, you get a Jordan block, which is which is not diagonalizable at all. So it only has one right eigenvector. And I want what I want to study in this talk is a quantitative notion of diagonalizability. So uh, what I'm going to do is introduce a parameter. Uh, that in some way measures how diagonalizable a matrix is. The parameter is the eigenvector condition number. So suppose a matrix is diagonalizable, then the its eigenvector condition number is just the you know norm of V times the norm of V inverse, where V is the similarity in the diagonalization, and you take the infimum over all possible scalings of V. So the eigenvector is only determined at the scale. Uh, and I'm going to call this the eigenvector condition number, and this is a quantitative measure of how linearly independent the eigenvectors are. So in our examples, uh, the first matrix is eigenvector condition number one, because the eigenvectors are orthogonal. In the second matrix, the eigenvector condition number is two to the n minus one. So that's that's way bigger. And in the last one, well, it's not defined, but you can imagine, you can in some sense say that it's infinity. And so the question uh, that this talk is about is um, is the following. So, so, so we know that every matrix is a limit of diagonalizable matrices. You can, you know, that's kind of obvious. But I want to ask a quantitative question, which is, uh, you know, given a matrix uh, and and some parameter delta, um, you know, can I uh, can I find a nearby matrix, uh, basically a, a perturbation of norm at most delta, such that the perturbed matrix has a small eigenvector condition number? So the qualitative statement is that yeah, every matrix can be approximated by diagonalizable matrices. Quantitative statement is how well can a matrix in general be approximated by matrices with small eigenvector condition number? So this picture is some sort of a cartoon that this red curve is a set of maybe non-diagonalizable matrices. You're given some matrix A that may or may not be on this curve. And you want to find a nearby matrix with a very small, smallest possible eigenvector condition number, which obviously will depend on delta and so forth. So any questions about the question? Okay, so so okay, so this is a kind of a clean um, may question. I interrupt? Yes, please. Uh -huh. Um, uh, your your matrix V may not be unique in the diagonalizable process, right? Yes. So so the way I defined this is I said you just let's say you take the best one. Oh, the best. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Um. Okay. So um. Any other? Okay. 
So, so you know, the, the original motivation for this actually came from numerical analysis. So here's a problem that comes up a lot. You have some square matrix A and you want to compute F of A for some analytic function. So let's say matrix exponential or maybe a fractional power or something like that. So the naive way to do this is, well, you diagonalize the matrix and then you just apply F to the eigenvalues if the matrix is diagonalizable. Uh, but this approach is actually not, you can't actually implement this because if the eigenvector condition number is big, this is highly unstable and you just can't implement this on a computer. So for example, for this Toplitz matrix T that I presented, if N is 100, the eigenvector condition number is 10 to the 30. And if you try to you know, do this in MATLAB, you'll get garbage. So, so what do you do with matrices like this? And so one observation uh, that was made by Brian Davies is the following. This experiment is by Mark Embry. It said, if you take this matrix or ma many matrices like this and you randomly perturb them, then this just goes away. That the, the eigenvector condition number decays very rapidly. So here's a graph where on the x-axis, I have the norm of a random perturbation E. And on the y-axis, I have the eigenvector condition number of this triplet matrix plus E. And I, you know, I did this, I mean, Mark Embry did this experiment a bunch of times. And you see in this plot that, you know, the original condition number is 10 to the 30, but if you add a perturbation of size, you know, 10 to the minus 10, it becomes 10 to the 10. If you add a perturbation of size 10 to the minus five, it becomes 10 to the five. So roughly the pattern seems to be that the eigenvector condition number is inversely proportional to the norm of the random perturbation. So this is an observed phenomenon. And this led, um, uh, yeah, so empirically, this matrix is close to a matrix with good eigenvector condition number. And this led uh, Davies to um, write this paper where he, he had this idea, which is, well, if you want to compute matrix functions of non-normal matrices, you shouldn't just try to apply it to the matrix. What you should do instead is find some nice perturbation E that slightly changes the matrix, but greatly regularizes the eigenvectors. So this was his idea. And uh, you know he wrote a paper and uh, he did even some experiments and this actually works. So here's, here's a code to compute the square root of a matrix. So, uh, so the first step is you, you add a small random perturbation, then you diagonalize the perturbed matrix, and then you take the square root of that diagonalization of the D that you get from that. And this actually beats MATLAB. Okay, so this is an experiment. Square root M is MATLAB square root function, and it just starts giving garbage after like 40 by 40 matrices. But if you do this regularization first, you can actually compute square roots of much larger matrices. So that's the original motivation for this question. And this led Davies to prove this theorem about it, which is that if you have any square matrix A with norm bounded by one, and you have a parameter delta, then there's a perturbation of norm at most delta. So the eigenvector condition number of the perturbed matrix is bounded by some constant times root n over delta to the n minus one. So this is a quantitative bound on how well you can approximate A by a matrix with log sufficient eigenvectors. Now, you may notice that this bound, you know, is not quite in line with that graph that I showed you. This seems to indicate an exponential dependence on N and on delta. I mean, that's what this bound gives. Whereas in the, in the graph, we had a linear dependence. And so this is actually not useful for computation. So Davies made this conjecture that actually the right, the truth should be that the bound is inversely proportional to delta. So for every A, there exists a perturbation E such of norm minus delta, uh, such that the eigenvector condition number of A plus E is bounded by some function of N over delta. And this conjecture is a statement about existence. It's not a statement about random matrices. It's just, does there even exist such a perturbation? Um, and Davies proved this conjecture for N equals three, because if you plug n equals three into the theorem above, you, you indeed get linear uh, dependence on delta. And he proved it for a special case of a Jordan block specifically. Uh, so the question is, is this true for every matrix? So any questions about this theorem of conjecture? Okay. So, um, so the result I want to present is that this conjecture is true. So this is theorem A. So the, the theorem says that, okay, the conjecture is true. For every matrix A with norm less than one, um, 
And every delta, there's a perturbation E of northernmost delta. So the eigenvector condition number of A plus E is at most four N to the three halves of the delta. So some slowly growing function of N divided by delta. So that improves the previous exponential dependence. And you know, in particular for algorithmic applications, if you, you normally set delta to be one over polynomial in N, this means every matrix is close to a matrix uh, with pol inverse polynomial close to a matrix whose eigenvector condition number is polynomial in N. And the polynomial is the key, right? It's not exponential, so it's much better. And uh, so I'll tell you the proof of this. This is impri implied by a probabilistic result, right? So theorem A is just an existence result, but it's actually implied by a probabilistic result. Before I do that, any questions about the statement of the theorem? Okay. So, so the theorem is about eigenvector condition number, but it's implied by a probabilistic result about eigenvalue condition number, which is another set of parameters associated with the matrix that I'll now tell you about. So what's eigenvalue condition number? So here's the definition. Suppose you have a diagonalizable matrix A, which now I've written you know, as a sum of spectral projectors. Uh, and you know, it has left and right eigenvectors. So the right eigenvectors are VI, the left eigenvectors are WI, and they're you know, normalized, so WI star VI equals one. Then the eigenvalue condition number of the ith eigenvalue so let's assume this matrix has distinct eigenvalues. Uh, the, the eigenvalue condition number of the ith eigenvalue is just the norm of the spectral projector. So it's norm of wi times norm of vi, which is just one over the cosine of the angle between the left and right eigenvalues. So, okay, so obviously, if the matrix is permission, this is just one because the left and right eigenvectors are the same. And this blows up as the left and right eigenvectors become close to orthogonal. So, right, okay, yeah. So these, you know, left, the right eigenvectors are the columns of V, the left eigenvectors are the rows of um, V and rows. So that's condition number of eigenvalues. And the reason it's called condition number is that this parameter tells you the sensitivity of the ith eigenvalue to perturbation. So you can easily check that, uh, you know, if you perturb the matrix a little bit, then the, you know, basically the magnitude of the derivative of the ith eigenvalue is, is given by this eigenvalue condition. So this measures the sensitivity of individual eigenvalues. So there are n of these numbers, one for each eigenvalue. Um, so you, to do this, you have to put the eigenvalues in a certain order, right? Um, well, so, so uh, I mean, I'm assuming the eigenvalues are distinct. Uh, yeah, you're saying just because I wrote i. Sure, so let's, let's order them by. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. You can you can order them using some arbitrary rule. Let's just assume they're the same. And you're just doing real real eigenvalues, right? There. No, 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 no. I'm doing any eigenvalues. Okay. So uh, you you have to give them names, but the, it can be arbitrary. I mean, uh, this is the statement written here is for infinitesimal for, for infinitesimal perturbation. You know, for for okay. in the limit as normal v goes to zero. So it makes sense. There won't be any collisions or anything. Okay, so that's eigenvalue condition number. Any any more questions about that? Okay, so this is related to eigenvector condition number by a very simple inequality. It's like a one line proof. Namely, the eigenvector condition number is both upper and lower bounded by the eigenvalue condition numbers in some simple way. So the eigenvector condition number is at least the largest eigenvalue condition number. And it's at most, some polynomial factor times the sum of squares of the eigenvalue uh, condition numbers. And the proof of this is kind of one line. You, you just upper bound the operator norms of V by the Frobenius norms, and then you just get this. So, so basically, this is a more refined quantity, which is polynomially related to the quantity we care about, eigenvector condition. Any questions about this? So let me now tell you theorem B, which is the result that implies theorem A. So theorem B is a probabilistic result. It says, suppose you have a matrix or a square complex matrix of norm bounded by one. And let's say you take G to be a matrix with ID complex standard Gaussian entries. So like complex Ginebra ensemble. Then 
you look at a plus gamma g, where gamma is some small parameter, and that's a random matrix, so g is random. And with probability one, it has n distinct eigenvalues, let's call them lambda one through lambda n, that's, you know, let's order them by magnitude, let's say. And you just a reminder, complex Gaussian is just, you know, it's a Gaussian in the complex plane, just in case you haven't seen it recently, it's just the real and imaginary parts are, are Gaussian uh, various halves. So now we have this random matrix. It has n random distinct eigenvalues. I can talk about their eigenvalue condition numbers, right? And theorem B says that uh, on average, these eigenvalue condition numbers are small. So the statement is, let's say you take any open ball B in the complex plane, uh, like, like this is open disk. Then the expectation of the sum of squares of eigenvalue condition numbers of the eigenvalues that land in that ball uh, this expectation is bounded by n over pi gamma squared times the volume, I mean, just the area of the ball. Okay. So, I mean, the, the, you fix B in advance, the eigenvalues are random. Some of them are going to end up in this B. And this is saying that the average of the sum of squares of their eigenvalue condition numbers is, you know, bounded by one over gamma squared. Okay. So, uh, some fairly mild dependence on gamma. There has to be some dependence on gamma, right? Because as the gamma gets smaller, you, you, you don't get any regularization at all, times the area of the ball. So uh, that's, uh, you know, that's, so some people often ask, like when I show them the theorem that this looks like it's not appropriately normalized, but if you think about it, you know, if you try to shrink this B very, to be very small, then you just won't see any eigenvalues in there. So the theorem becomes vacuum. So that's the sense in which the theorem is scaled appropriately. But any questions about theorem B? Okay. So let me put this in context. So theorem B is a state is a a statement about expect an upper bound on the sum of ex, uh, expectations of these eigenvalue condition numbers. Uh, these have been studied in great detail in the mathematical physics literature for the special case when A is zero. So for, in the case when the matrix is a pure complex Gaussian matrix. And in that case, uh, people have very fine asymptotics for these eigenvalue condition numbers. They're called overlaps in mathematical physics, especially this recent work of Brogad, Dubak, and Fedorov. Uh, another case that's been very well studied is the case when A is tuplets. And again, there's a long sequence of results proving very precise sort of limiting laws for you know, these, eigen, these eigenvalue condition numbers. And so you know, theorem B is, is much cruder. It's just an upper bound on expectations, but it's also more general because there's no assumption on A, it can be anything. And it's also completely non-asymptotic. There's no limit. Like you can do this for n equals two, and it's still fine. So that's how this relates to the existing literature. And I should say that the this Bourgard and Dubac result implies that the dependence on n and gamma squared in this theorem cannot be improved because when you take a equals zero, that's like pretty right. So that's theorem B. So any questions about theorem B? Okay, so let me just show you how theorem B implies theorem A. So it's not a half slide proof. Okay, so this is theorem B. So how does it imply theorem A? Well, let's take gamma to be some parameter less than one over square root n. Um, uh, then, okay, the norm of G is bounded by, you know, like square root n or, or I guess two square root n. So, so the, the norm of A plus gamma G is uh, is bounded by um, uh, four with very high probability, right? So there, there's some a priori very high probability bound on the norm of this random matrix. And so now I'm going to take my b to just be a disk of radius four around the origin. And so now, uh, you know, with high probability, all of the eigenvalues of the random matrix are going to fall in this disk of radius four. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, according to theorem b. The expected sum of squares of eigenvalue condition numbers inside that disk is bounded by n over gamma squared times of area of that disk, which is some constant, right? So that would just be, um, you know, n over gamma squared. 
Now, if I, if I apply Markov's inequality and take a union, if, if I apply Markov's inequality, then I get that with some constant probability, you know, this sum of squares is bounded by n over gamma squared. I multiply by n and take the square root, I get this inequality. That's just Markov applied to theorem B. And then, you know, I just take a union bound with the fact that all the eigenvalues lie in the disk, and I pass from the sum of eigenvalues in B to the sum of all the eigenvalues, because all the eigenvalues are in the disk. But now I'm happy, right? Because this was the upper bound on the eigenvector condition number that I wanted. And so I proved that if I, you know, if, if I take this uh, random perturbation, then with constant probability, the eigenvector condition number is bounded by n over gamma. But now, okay, my, my perturbation is gamma times g, and g itself has norm about square root n. So really, the delta, that, you know, the size of the perturbation is gamma times square root n. So okay, I pick up another square root n. I get this entry through that. So it's like a one-line implication. You just apply it to B being a disk of radius four around the origin. So any questions about this? Okay, so this is kind of, you know, the real content is in theorem B. So let me now tell you the proof of theorem B. So theorem B is based on yet another concept, which is a pseudo spectra. Let me tell you what the pseudo spectrum of a matrix is. So if you have a, you know, a matrix, uh, the epsilon pseudo spectrum is, um, it's a set in the complex plane parameterized by epsilon. And it's simply a, a level set of the norm of the resolvent. So it's a set of points at which the resolvent has norm at least one of epsilon. So that's the pseudo spectrum. And in this picture, we plotted various pseudo spectra of some matrix with, I guess, three eigenvalues. So the poles here are just the eigenvalues and, uh, you know, uh, obviously, uh, but the pseudo spectra are these sets that are around these poles that tell you where the resolvent is flowing up. Uh, so, so pseudo spectra are yet another measure, a uh, way to measure spectral instability. So for normal matrices, they're kind of boring. The pseudo spectrum of a normal matrix is with parameter epsilon is just the union of this of radius epsilon around its eigenvalues. So that's the picture on the left. But for a non-normal matrix, the pseudo spectrum can be different and can be much bigger. So here's a cartoon of a pseudo spectrum of a non-normal matrix. All these pictures are stolen from this very nice book of Professor and Embry. And uh, you know, why is this relevant? Well, uh, you know, the pseudo spectrum is a measure of spectral instability. Or spectral stability, just like the eigenvalue condition number. Uh, in particular, the epsilon pseudo spectrum is uh, equal to the set of uh, points where the least singular value of z minus m is less than epsilon. That's kind of obvious from the definition. And uh, it's a nice exercise to see that it's also just the union of spectra of all matrices at distance at most epsilon from a. So that's the last line over here. So that explains why pseudo spectrum is a measure of spectral instability. Small pseudo spectrum means the spectrum is stable, large pseudo spectrum means it's not. And so going back to our example, these are the pseudo spectra. So in our first example S, the pseudo spectrum is just, it's just disks around the eigenvalues. It's boring, I didn't plot it. But for this uh, second example, which is highly non-normal, the pseudo spectrum is much bigger. So these are the boundaries of the pseudo spectra for epsilon going from 10 to the minus one to 10 to the minus 16. And you can see that, you know, there's macroscopic changes in the eigenvalues, even when the changes in the matrix are very small, when epsilon is small. And then the Jordan block, of course, has even bigger pseudo spectrum. Okay, so that's the pseudo spectrum. And it is related to eigenvector condition number and eigenvalue condition number, the two concepts we introduced earlier. The, um, uh, the epsilon pseudo spectrum is always contained in disks around the eigenvalues whose radii are proportional to the eigenvector condition number. So if the eigenvector condition number is small, the pseudo spectrum is small. And similarly, if the eigenvalue condition numbers are small, then at least in the regime as epsilon goes to zero, the pseudo spectrum is small. It's contained in disks of radius, the eigenvalue condition number. So this is closely related to the two concepts earlier. 
uh, it's, it's, it's a much more refined concept in some ways. So any questions about pseudo spectrum in general? I should say everything can be defined for operators as well. We'll just talk about matrices for now. Okay, so now let me prove theorem B. So the proof has four steps, which are all short. So the first step is to um, pass from the eigenvalue condition numbers to the area of the pseudo spectrum. Okay, so here's a simple lemma, which, I mean, uh, I mean, I, it's, it's, I, I, I don't think it's new. It's, it's, it's you'll, as you'll see, it's like a one-line proof. Um, suppose you have an open set. Suppose you have a matrix with distinct eigenvalues. The sum of squares of the eigenvalue condition numbers in, in that set is uh, the volume of the pseudo spectrum, so the epsilon pseudo spectrum restricted to the set. Uh, the lim its scale, its limit as epsilon goes to zero of the volume over epsilon squared. So it's the rate of shrinkage of the pseudo spectrum as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. So this is kind of a converse to the statement I mentioned on the previous slide, which is if the eigenvalue condition numbers are small, then the pseudo spectra are small. It's saying that as epsilon goes to zero, this relationship becomes tight. And that if you know the area of the pseudo spectrum, you can read off the eigenvalue condition. And the proof of this is kind of one line. You just look at the resolvent, okay? You, you expand it near an eigenvalue. And you know, if, you're if you're close to an eigenvalue, it's, it's just rank one, right? It's just, uh, I mean, everything else becomes bounded. And then it's kind of, it's kind of clear that uh, you know, for the resolvent to blow up, uh, this rank one term has to blow up. And uh, you know, the constant that appears there is just the norm of the spectral projector, which is the eigenvalue condition. So it's like a one line kind of proof. You just, you just locally look at what happens to the resolvent here. And so that's lemma one, re relating the eigenvalue condition numbers to scaled area of the pseudo spectrum. So any questions about lemma one? Okay, and uh, while we're at it, why don't we just put a limb in here? Well, it will be handy later. Okay, so that's lemma one. So we've passed from eigenvalue condition number to area of the pseudo spectrum. So now our goal is to study the area of the pseudo spectrum of my random matrix. And the tool I'm gonna use to do that is anti-concentration. So here's, here's a sort of, uh, here's a, a well-known result by Spielman and Tang in smooth analysis. So what this says is if you take any real n by n matrix and you add a Gaussian with real uh, standard uh, normal entries, then the probability that its least singular value is bounded by epsilon uh, decays as roughly epsilon over gamma times some c squared n. So the thing I want to emphasize is the dependence on epsilon and on gamma. Okay, so this is saying if you take any matrix and you perturb it a little bit, it's unlikely to have a small least singular value. And this tail decays uh, proportionally to the, um, you know, this, this epsilon uh, like tail parameter and inverse proportionally to the size of the Gaussian that you add. Makes sense. If you add more Gaussian, you'll, you're less likely to be singular. Now, the proof of this, uh, let me tell you the proof in one dimension. In one dimension, this is just a it's M is just a number and G is just also a number. And gamma G is just a Gaussian of variance, uh, variance uh, gamma squared. And so the probability that this single least singular value is small is just the probability that this number is small. So M is a fixed number, gamma G is a random number. Well, the probability that this number is small is equal to the probability that this Gaussian is close to you know, M over gamma minus M over gamma. And by close is now epsilon over gamma. Okay, this is the probability that a random perturbation of, of M is close, uh, is close to zero. And this is like a trivial computation, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a Gaussian. The, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the point which maximizes this probability is just, is just zero. And then, okay, you just look at the density and you see that the, the Gaussian is, is unlikely to be very close to zero. So, so this is the proof for n equals one. It's just anti you know, the fact that the Gaussian, the Gaussian has a density. Of course, the proof for higher n is more difficult, 
the Sunker, Spielman, and Tang originally did, did this using some invariance properties of this uh, random Gaussian matrix. Uh, th there are a number of ways to do it. I'll discuss one on the next slide as well, but uh, this is sort of the starting point. So, so any, any questions about this? Okay. Now, okay, so this is for real random perturbations of real matrices. Uh, the, the key ingredient in our proof is the following very simple observation, which is what happens if you do complex perturbations instead? And the key thing that happens is that the tail of this probability gets squared when you add a complex Gaussian. Okay. If you have a complex n by n matrix and you add a, a complex Gaussian perturbation g, the probability of the least singular value of n plus gamma g is at most epsilon decays as epsilon squared over gamma squared. Okay, so the squared is really important. And the proof for n equals one is, you know, it's the same. Okay, but this probability is the probability that a complex Gaussian is close to some particular number, and the closeness is epsilon over gamma. But this is the key: the complex Gaussian is two-dimensional. So it has a density with respect to the two-dimensional Lebesgue measure of the complex frame. And so this tail decays as the area of a circle instead of the length of a segment. And you get epsilon squared over gamma squared. Now, OK, that's the proof for n equals 1. For any higher n, we use a result of Schniadi, uh, which uh, you know, was proved in, in, the, in the free probability uh, context, which essentially says that, yeah, the worst case for this is the case when m is 0. Um, and then the case of m equals zero is already solved by Edelman in 1984. So essentially, we don't have to do any really new work here from a random matrix theory perspective to prove this well. But the key is this epsilon squared. Okay, so what is this saying? It's saying if you take any matrix and you add a random complex matrix, it's highly, it's, it's unlikely that the least singular value will be small in this very specific way. Now we're going to use this to study the area of the pseudo spectrum. So that's step three. So lemma two, which I on the previous slide said is this bound on the least singular value. Let's use that to study the area of the pseudo spectrum. So let's now fix some epsilon. So that's pseudo spectral parameter, and fix a point Z in the complex plane. And consider the shifted matrix Z minus A. So then what does this lemma say? Well, it says that the probability that the least singular value of z minus a minus gamma g is less than epsilon is at most n times epsilon squared times gamma squared. That's, that's literally what it says. But now let's recall, this was one of the equivalent definitions of pseudo spectrum, right? Least singular value being small. So really this is saying that the probability that this fixed point z is in the epsilon pseudo spectrum is at most n epsilon squared over gamma squared. And this is true for any for any point C. Okay, but now that's good, right? It's saying that any fixed point is unlikely to be in the pseudo spectrum. So if I want to compute the area, I just need to integrate over points in a, in a ball, right? So suppose I fix some ball B and I'm interested in the expected area of the pseudo spectrum restricted to that ball. Well, that's just an integral, right? It's the expectation of the integral of this indicator. Uh, that z is in the epsilon pseudo spectrum. Remember that epsilon pseudo spectrum is a random set in the complex space. And now the key step in the whole proof is this: that you do you switch you use Fubini to switch the integral. So you, the integral it becomes the integral of the expected value, but this is now a local problem, right? This is the probability that a fixed point lies in the pseudo spectrum. And we we bounded this, right? That's what lemma two tells us that. Any fixed point is unlikely to be in the pseudo spectrum. So therefore, the area of the pseudo spectrum cannot be very large. And if you just plug this in, this estimate in, you get that the expected area of the pseudo spectrum for every fixed epsilon is bounded by n epsilon squared over gamma squared times the volume of this, of the area of this uh, piece. So the key step is just the switching of integrals. That's like the whole content of the proof. Right? I mean, that's really the important step. Any questions about this? Okay, so we basically we proved that the area of the pseudo spectrum is small. Well, for every fixed epsilon. And now to finish the proof, um, 
so let's call this lemma three, finish the proof, we need to take a limit. Because remember, the eigenvalue condition numbers are limiting areas of the pseudospin. So just to be pedantic, just define the scaled area via function f sub epsilon, it's on negative. Lemma three shows that the limit of this function is bounded by n over gamma squared, because for every epsilon you have this bound. And then just by Fatou's lemma, you push the in, uh, expectation out of the limit. So now the expected limit is bounded by n over gamma squared, but we saw by lemma one that that's just equal to the sum of squares of eigenvalues. And that's, that's it. That's that you can push this estimate on the area of the pseudospectrum into the limit. And then the limiting area of the pseudospectrum gives you the eigenvalue condition numbers, which is what we wanted. And so that's the proof. So this is the whole proof in one slide. It's basically like switching limits and integrals twice. So the expected sum of the squares of the eigenvalue condition numbers is the expectation of the limiting area, which is bounded by the limit of the expected area, which is bounded by this Fubini trick by this tail estimate on this probability of one point being in the solar system, which we can easily bound using some known results in random matrix. So that's the whole proof in one slide. And uh, here's a cartoon showing what's going on in this proof. So on the left, or it's not a cartoon, it's actually an experiment. On the left, you have a pseudo spectra of a 10 by 10 triplet matrix with all eigenvalues at zero. And you can see that the pseudo spectra are big. Like these curves are the boundaries of the pseudo spectra over various parameters. And when you randomly perturb this, what, what you get is what's on the right, which is the eigenvalues moved all over the place, right? So they, the, the eigenvalues being the black dots are now somewhere else. But the pseudo spectra are now small. And this is the key conceptual point of the proof that even though it's hard to control what happens to the eigenvalues, you can reason about their stability by looking at this area of the pseudo spectrum instead of looking at where the eigenvalues are. So that's somehow conceptually what's going on in this proof. So any questions about the proof or this picture? Okay. Um, so that's the summary of, of the talk. I mean, basically, we started off with this seemingly difficult quantity to bound, the condition number of the eigenvectors. Then we reduced it to an easier quantity, which is the condition numbers of the eigenvalues. We reduced that to an even easier quantity, I mean, albeit look more complicated looking, which is the pseudo spectrum. But then we could localize this study of the pseudo spectrum to a single point because of this, you know, we cared about the area, and then we could just study one point. And then we could use random matrix theory technique to answer this very local, you know, relatively easy question about singular values of shifts of this matrix. And this proof really exploited a lot of symmetries of a complex Gaussian. I didn't tell you the details, but but it really did use them. Um, so th this leaves. I mean, when we did, this work is at this point almost two years old. And when we did this, we were, for several, for a while, we were wondering whether this um, complex Gaussian is really needed. Because in this proof, it's really crucial, right? Like the whole point is that you get this epsilon squared bound on the tail. If you got epsilon, then this limit would just be infinity and it wouldn't work. But that's why we had to use complex Gaussian. And so one conceptual question was, well, what happens if you have real Gaussian? Right? So for real Gaussians, you don't get a tail of epsilon squared. You just get a tail of epsilon, at least when the shift Z is real. And so this argument totally falls apart. And so for a while, this was kind of, we weren't, it was unclear whether this phenomenon is really uses complex numbers, or uses complex Gaussians. But actually, it turned out we could show that um, there's a more subtle thing going on, which is if you have, if you have imaginary z sufficiently far from the real axis, you get this quadratic tail decay even for real Gaussian. This is inspired by the thesis of Stephen Shaw. Uh, and you know, using this, we were able to prove that the theorem is also true for real Gaussians and really for any random matrix with real absolutely continuous uh, entries, independent entries. 
the bounds we got on the parameters were considerably worse, but they're still polynomial in N over gamma to some constant, which is what's important. So we got, you know, gamma to the three halves, and then independently, Jan, Sai, and Swani got C equals one plus little of one. There's a very recent, uh, I guess, two of not yet published improvement by Cipollini, Erdos, and Schroeder, where they use supersymmetry techniques to even improve the dependence on M and, and gamma even further. So this is sort of an ongoing direction, which is to understand for which perturbations does this eigenvector regularization phenomenon hold. So, so that's the talk. I want to end with three questions. Uh, um, uh, the first question is, is actually comes from operator theory, which maybe is more familiar to this audience. So, so in, in our result, theorem A, we proved that, you know, the bound on the eigenvector condition number is, you know, four n to the three halves over delta, and n is the dimension. So a very natural question is, does there have to be any dependence on the dimension? Could it be that such a theorem holds without any dependence on n? And we don't know the answer to that. And in fact, this was conjectured by Davidson, Herrera, and Salinas in 1989. Uh, and it implies uh, that every quasi-diagonal operator is a norm limit of algebraic quasi-diagonal operators. I put that in quotes because I personally don't know what that means, but it has this implication. Um, and you know, the, the emphasis in this conjecture is very different, right? So in Davies' conjecture, the real the emphasis is on delta, that you want linear or you know a good dependence on delta, the perturbation parameter, and you don't care that much about the dependence on n. In this conjecture, it's the opposite. The, depend, the emphasis is on the dependence on, I mean, the, the, you know, of course, if you're going to do something in infinite dimensions, it better not depend on n. So you're okay with some more outlandish dependence on, on delta, you know, it could be exponential or whatever, but um, we don't want a dependence on n. So this is, is wide open. This part, huh? So that's one question. Another question, which is sort of a algorithmic question, or I mean, uh, yeah, is, um, can you actually find these perturbations? So we know that if you do a random perturbation, it works with constant probability, uh, but nobody knows how to actually find one without using randomness. Uh, and it, it seems quite challenging uh, given the structure of the proof. So that's, that's also open. And finally, uh, in the sort of more technical random matrix theory direction, uh, it would be of interest to know whether all this stuff works for sparse random matrices. Because in numerical analysis, those are the ones you want for efficiency. And I don't think the existing techniques can, can do that. So we're really using, you know, the we're, we're using pretty strong properties of these of these IAD ensembles uh, to prove these theorems. And so another well-motivated open direction is suppose you have an arbitrary matrix and you had a sparse random Gaussian matrix, but do you still get regularization of the eigenvector? And I don't know. Anyway, that's it. That's uh, that's that's all. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Any questions, please? So that's very interesting. Uh, question about finding the algorithm uh, because uh, at the end of the day you would like to do some efficient computations right uh, yeah I mean it's actually so randomness is not too bad for efficiency it's just bad for reproducibility so mm -hmm. you know um, the people who write numerical linear algebra libraries really care that you can you kind of get the same answer if you run it twice and so that's that's really the the motivation. But yeah, it's 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 very. I mean, I should say Davy's original proof was deterministic, but it gave an exponential dependence. So um, it would be great if if such if you could uh, yeah find some way find some way to do that. For, but for but in terms of of random algorithm, you you require longer time, right, and uh, a lot of computations, right? Uh, no, not really, because uh, th this is for the usual application is for dense linear algebra problems. So, uh, uh, you know, we have n squared entries, and 
anyway, diagonalization is going to take more than n squared time, like way more. So adding a little bit of noise to each entry is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point, if you're there's a whole branch of sparse linear algebra where the matrix is assumed to be sparse, then you really need the sparse version of the result. And that is a real thing. That if you have lots of zeros, you don't want to destroy them by adding randomness. And that's that's okay. Okay. I, I will have uh, to use some other question, but maybe uh, somebody else would like to ask a question at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. Now, now we have a, a brief break, uh, and we start in about uh, ten minutes with another talk. So, uh, have some. A cold drink, so maybe maybe wine, <laughs> and see you again soon. <laughs> My question is about some uh, conjecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which conjecture? Uh, about uh, blocks of all inequality for some matrices, all right? Uh, excuse me, sorry, I didn't. I got knocked off for a moment. What was the question? Um, well, I, uh, a long time ago, uh, together with uh, Olkevich and Habish, uh, we had a little paper about uh, uh, blocks of all for for matrix uh, algebras with some uh, conjecture and, and that's probably an excellent problem for you <laughs> i will send you i will send you something okay oh yeah i would, I would love to to hear about it okay thank you mm -hmm.